like me and maybe the only thing you knew about Joan of Arc was based on the Mila Djokovic movie or Age of Empires 2 because that's what it was for me until now so I had a friend suggest doing a Joan of Arc heroine video and here we are we're gonna be doing that if this is something that interests you stick around let's dive into it all right let's start with some of the heavy stuff first this is a huge reason why Joan of Arc was a big deal for a warning, my summary is an oversimplification of the Hundred Years' War, and I urge you to check out the description for more information and links. Let's break it down. Basically, this is a conflict between France and England over the legitimate succession to the French throne. There was an interruption of a direct male line, so everyone panicked. I mean, there was a kid, the dead king's nephew, Edward III of England, whose mother was the king's sister. She claimed the throne of France for her son by the rule of proximity of blood. But ladies don't know anything, and screw that. Instead, it passes to the king's cousin, Philip VI? What? In addition, there was already previous conflicts between the French and the English from many, many years ago. Later kings of England still had estates and interests in France, so the English would try to assert dominance, disregarding any French policies. The English are trying to gain power, and then the French are trying to maintain power. No one agrees to anything, and it becomes a territorial pissing contest, which then becomes one of the largest conflicts in the Middle Ages. The cousin and nephew's antagonistic relationship blows up into a full-blown war by 1337. 166 years. Five generations of kings from two rival dynasties fighting for Western Europe. And this conflict affects Europe for even longer than this. It's a huge deal. And this is where we're gonna start with Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc appears in the final period known as the Lancastrian War, which is between 1415 and 1453. This is after the House of Lancaster the ruling house of England at the time during the Hundred Years' War. Joan was born in northeastern France in a place called Domremy Village. This was a settlement on the border between France and the Holy Roman Empire. It was a place of conflicting loyalties. While the people of the village were generally loyal to Charles VII, the Dauphin or heir to the throne of France, Many of the nearby territories were loyal to the Duchy of Burgundy, which was allied with the English. I promise I'll have a map. Joan was born to Isabel Romy and Jacques d'Arc. She had two older brothers and a younger brother and sister. They were farmers by trade, and they lived in this village that was torn by this conflict of war. England occupied much of northern France at the time, and a lot of people from Domremy had to abandon their home under the threat of invasion. At the age of 13, 13, Joan began to hear voices, which she determined had been sent by God to give her a mission of overwhelming importance to save France by expelling its enemies and to install Charles the Dauphin, next heir to the throne of France, as its rightful king, which at the time was held by the English. Joan was obviously denied to see the Dauphin, a 13-year-old girl who could hear God and help the French reclaim the throne? Well, with much persistence, she was finally able to see the Dauphin to present her case. This took at least two times. This was at the time that the throne of France was being disputed by the Dauphin, Charles VII, and King Henry IV. 
So before meeting Joan, Charles wanted to test her. He would dress as one of his courtiers, and one of them would dress as him. If Joan were truly sent by God, then she would know the true Dauphin. Well, surprise, Joan went right up to Charles and could not be dissuaded that it was not him. And another interesting detail is that in private, Joan convinced him of her legitimacy by telling him things that he had only said to God in prayer. Charles still, surprisingly, wasn't convinced. Um, pretty close, though. He needed to make sure that she wasn't like an evil sorceress. So he had her examined for orthodoxy and purity by an assembly of clergy. She was declared an orthodox Christian in good standing and presented herself to the Dauphin again as to answer his problems at Orléans. So prophecies had been in circulation for years throughout France that a maiden in armor would arise from the region of Lorraine to save France. And Joan fulfilled that prophecy in traveling with an army to Orléans in full battle gear. So Joan never actually participated in battle. She didn't swing swords around or anything, but she was an extremely skilled strategist. Joan leaned into the idea of being a hero, and Joan embraced the citizens of Orléans and going among them daily to encourage, inspire, and deliver food and supplies. The men would try to keep her out of the war councils since she was a lady, you know, because ladies can't handle that. They couldn't keep her out. She was able to listen even though she couldn't participate. Repeatedly, Joan called for direct action against key points in the English line. She was ignored, but continually and patiently suggested courses of action and she also went amongst the people to encourage them and lift their spirits. Finally, she rallied the troops and led them in an assault on the English, which was ultimately successful. Even further, she was backed by a militia of citizens which had responded to her inspiration and all of her good deeds. This further broke the siege. Joan actually took an arrow to her chest, but she still persevered and carried on, inspiring others to fight on. The Siege of Orléans was lifted in nine days after her arrival. Joan wanted to see Charles crowned. That was like her big thing, and kept pushing to go to the city of Reims. Over time, they made their way over across enemy territory. And you'll see this on the map here. The French were so successful that the Burgundians of France said, fuck it, just let them on through. And Charles VII was crowned King of France in 1423 at the France Cathedral. This was keeping with tradition. This had to happen. Joan of Arc was by his side at this time too. French hopes were dimmed, however, when Joan was captured by the Burgundians in 1430, not that long afterwards, and she was sold to her English enemies. She was thrown from her horse and was left outside the town's gates as they closed. Joan was held in the English-controlled city of Rouen, where her trial for witchcraft and heresy took place. There is a lot of interesting things about this trial. If Joan were telling the truth, then the English had been wrong in God's eyes for continuing the war, and the English clergy had been wrong in supporting it. Basically, Joan had to be found guilty, and yet it's kind of hard to refute the evidence that God had directed her victories. She was this farm girl from a small village with no experience in leadership or military matters. She was 16! But look at how far she'd come. It's unreal. Another issue is that she had already been examined for her faith and purity. She's kind of the real deal. 
The only option was to trick her into confessing that she had lied about her visions and was guilty of witchcraft. Joan was persistent almost throughout her entire prison sentence. She would even speak fondly and defend Charles VII. She wouldn't reveal any of his plans. She was very loyal. And Charles VII, the King of France, made no attempt to negotiate Joan's release regardless of how much she helped him. He didn't want to be associated with a potential witch. It took a year in captivity and the threat of death for Joan to sign a confession denying she could speak to God. However, a few days later, she withdrew her claim and was sentenced to death. Some believed she displayed kind of an act of rebellion. She was dressing like a man even after she was told she couldn't after confessing. Others believe she was actually forced to dress this way by the guards so that she would be burned at the stake. Ultimately, she was burned at the stake twice. They wanted to make sure she was dead. The King Charles never tried to free Joan, but a lot of other people did. The Hundred Years' War finally ended 22 years later, and this is probably the result of Joan's charisma, inspiration, and devotion to God. After the Siege of Orléans, the French consistently won more battles than they had previously. Later, a trial ordered by Charles VII cleared her name. Finally, he did a good deed. Long before she was declared a patron saint in 1922, Joan of Arc had attained mythic stature, became a martyr, and inspired numerous works of art and literature. After the French Revolution in the late 1700s, she became a national symbol of France. Joan is a symbol of French identity and nationalism. She is also an example of being a feminist and devoted to God. This war that wasn't originally a religious war had now kind of become one. And again, Joan inspired people through her acts of God. She was morally good, and this boosted the French's morale to ultimately reclaim the Northern ter Territory from the hands of the English. Did Joan talk to God? It's still a mystery. Joan of Arc would always say that there was a bright light often accompanied in her visions and that she heard the voices more distinctly when bells would sound. A lot of these details suggest to some experts that Joan probably suffered from one of numerous neurological and psychiatric conditions that trigger hallucinations or delusions. Some of these could be migraines, there's bipolar disorder, could have been a brain lesion from when she was younger. There's just to name a few. Or, it's possible, she was able to communicate with God. Another really fun fact about Joan of Arc is she was the one that inspired the ever-popular Bob haircut, and that originated in Paris in 1909. Joan of Arc is still an inspiration over half a century later. One thing that I love about Joan of Arc is that she was a real person and we have made her into a massive myth. She is a heroine. She embodies a lot of the qualities we uh, value as far as like the hero's journey. She was even a martyr. She really did do everything you could possibly imagine in mythological storytelling. It's pretty phenomenal. If you like goddesses and heroines, make sure to subscribe down below but you can also continue watching. There's a lot of history, lots of goddesses and heroines all across the globe, and I'm willing to share all of that with you and go on this journey. Just click here. But I will see you in two weeks. We're gonna be doing some Aboriginal stuff. I'm pumped.